Hello, Hi. I'm Peter Chesky, Dr. Chesky. Nice to meet you. I, I understand you're here wondering about breast augmentation. Yes. There's a, a number of options with any surgery, and certainly with breast augmentation, that's very much the same. So usually what I do is kind of go over all the different options, all the pros, cons, advantages, disadvantages, and so on. None of these things do you have to decide today, but these are things that you want to think about and plan about before you go ahead. So you can change your mind. You don't have to decide these things now, and you can change your mind right up to the surgery. We have all the different sizes and styles of implants here. so. On the day of surgery, we'll go over things again or before that, and you can change your mind even up to the day of surgery. By the time you're asleep, that's pretty well it, but, but up until then, you can kind of change your mind, okay? First thing to think of is size, and there's a number of ways to pick size. One of the best ways is with pictures, because pictures not only give size, but shape, and there's many, many different shapes. So if you bring me a picture from a magazine or the internet, or we have a, a number of pictures here, I can use that as a guide to try to match up as close as possible. The other way is cup size. I want to be a B, full B, small C, mid C, small C, mid C, full C, uh, small D, mid D, full D, double D, what have you. Um, another way is you can try on different bra sizes and fill them with like rice or uh, uh, water bags and so on. And we have some sample implants that you can try on here in different bra sizes to kind of, kind of get an idea uh, of what you like. But I think the best way is with pictures because I can try to match that up and they not only give size but shape. And we'll talk a little more about size and shape when we have a look at you. The next thing to think of is the type of implant. And I predominantly use saline implants. Saline is just salt water. They're completely 100% safe and natural. 70% of your body and my body and everybody's body is made of saline. So heaven forbid, worst case scenario, there's any leak or rupture or deflation. There's no pain. There's no health problems. It just means one side will be uh, full C or so and one side kind of goes back to what you're in and your body just absorbs the water. It's just like drinking a glass of water. It's just water. The same I, uh, saline that we use in IV is the same saline that we use for breast implants. It does mean that you're probably going to want to have another surgery. You don't want to walk around lopsided the rest of your life. Now, that should not happen. The old implants from the 1970s, 1980s were only designed to last about 10 years. And you've heard about people changing their implants every 10 years. Well, that's the way that it used to be. And that rumor kind of still persists, but that's really no longer the case. The implants that I use now and that most doctors use should last the rest of your life. Unless there's a problem or a leakage or deflation, which is quite unlikely, you leave them alone for the rest of your life. And the manufacturer actually guarantees or warranties them for the rest of your life. So if at any point for the rest of your life there's any leakage or rupture or deflation, for the rest of your life the manufacturer will pay for new implants. The actual implant, not the surgery, but the actual implant. And in the first 10 years, they also pay $1,200 towards the cost of the surgery. And there's an upgraded warranty that you can get that they will actually pay up to $2,400 towards the surgery, plus the implants for the rest of your life. And that you get by just sending in the serial numbers for your implant, plus $100 to the manufacturer within the first 30 days after surgery. And I would recommend that you do that. That being said, the chance of a leak or rupture is pretty low. And the most important thing is that there's really no health problems if it does happen. Okay? The next thing to think of is the position of the implant. And that relates to the large chest muscle, the pectoralis major muscle. That's the muscle you do push-ups with or bench press with and so on. You can either go underneath the muscle or on top of the muscle. If you go underneath the muscle, it tends to look more natural, feel more natural. It's also better for breastfeeding and it's also better for mammograms. The last thing to think about is the incision site. There's four different incision sites. Two are on the breast and two are away from the breast. The two on the breast is one at the bottom of the nipple. There's one underneath the breast, in or near the crease below the breast. Both of those are good, commonly used incisions, but they do have a number of drawbacks. One, of course, is the scar on the breast. Two, the incision that cuts around the nipple has the highest chance of loss of sensation to the nipple. And that's been borne out in studies and so on. If you cut a nerve, it doesn't work after that. So if you cut a nerve around the nerves around the nipple, they will not or may not function afterwards. And the nipple incision has been shown to have the highest loss of sensation. Both of those incisions cut through the breast tissue, especially the nipple incision. If you cut through the breast tissue, it can interfere with breastfeeding because some of the breast ducts are cut. 
It can also interfere with mammograms because of the scar in the breast tissue. Whenever we get a mammogram, what we're looking for is scarring or lumps or cysts or bumps or whatever in the breast tissue. If you already have a scar in there from previous nipple surgery, it certainly will not cause a cancer, but it may make the mammogram a little more difficult to read or interpret. We can avoid all these problems and have a lot faster recovery by avoiding the cuts or incisions on the chest or breast whatsoever. The one I like is through the belly button. Make a little incision on the inside of the belly button. Your belly button is a scar already. Tunnel up underneath between the skin and the abdominal muscle. Make a space or a position for the implant with special instruments and scopes. In fact, a number of the instruments are named after me because I designed a number of them. The implants are rolled up like a cigar. It goes in very small, passed up with the aid of a tube, and inflated once in place. Leaves no scars or marks or incisions on the chest or breast whatsoever. Better for nipple sensation because we're not cutting around the nipple. Better for breastfeeding and mammograms because we don't cut through the breast tissue, we go underneath. And the recovery is a lot, lot faster. Two, three, four days rather than a week or two. One of the big, big advantages is it tends to reduce the incidence of what's called capsule contracture encapsulation. That's the hardening of the breast when the breasts get hard. The reason that it happens is that anytime you traumatize the body, or irritate the body, or do surgery on the body, in any way, the body will ooze or drain this yellow picky protein fluid called serosanguinous fluid. You know if you skin your knee and it oozes this yellow pinky almost pussy stuff? That's your body's own fluid and it's designed to seal off the wound with a crust or a scab so that the body can heal underneath in a protected environment. The same fluid accumulates after any surgery and after breast implants can accumulate around the implant. On your knee, after a week or so, on the outside, the crust just falls off. But on the inside, it can stay there, giving you a firm, hard crust around the implant. That tends not to happen with the belly button approach. And it's simply because we're coming from below, and because of plain old gravity, any of the fluid that accumulates just tends to drain down and out the belly button. We're not so worried about how the belly button's going to heal, it's a scar already. If the fluid doesn't stay around the breast implant, you shouldn't get that thick, hard, firm crust. In fact, the incidence of capsule contracture in the other types of incisions in it is anywhere from 8 to 16 percent uh, in the literature. In my hands with a belly button procedure, uh, and I've done over 10,000, I do more than anyone in the world through the belly button, the incidence is almost non-existent. Okay? The last way to do it is through the armpit, make an incision through the armpit and come from above down. Again, it has a number of the same advantages. No cutting around the nipple. No, so it's better for nipple sensation. No scarring on the breast, so it's better for, for uh, uh, breastfeeding and better for mammograms because we go underneath the breast. But I tend not to like it for a number of reasons. One, because you're, you're coming from above, down, and outside in, the implants tend to ride a little high and a little more up to the side. The armpit tends to be the most painful way to have the surgery. But the main reason I don't like it is that fluid, that serosanguinous fluid. If it does accumulate, and it always accumulates, um, it's not going to go up against gravity and out the armpit. So in fact, the incidence of capsule contracture is the highest. I do all the different ways. The price is all the same way, but I think by far and away the best way is through the belly button, especially in the right hands. Any questions so far? I think I'm ready to go, Doc. Okay.